Welcome to Trib Talk. I'm Jennifer Napier Pierce with the Salt Lake Tribune. KUED Channel 7 and the Salt Lake Tribune have teamed up yet again to bring you some of the most beautiful, most inspiring, and most notable experiences from our beautiful state. From a trek to the spiral jetty to cattle roundups on the Tavaputs Plateau, it's the Utah Bucket List, part two. And today on Trip Talk, we're talking about more of the must sees and the must do's in Utah's natural playground. And joining me on the chat to talk about Utah Bucket List 2, KUED producer Nancy Green. Nancy, great to have you back. Thanks so much for coming in. Thanks for having me. Also with this Tribune outdoor reporter Brett Prettyman, who's had the very tough job of having to go to all these incredible places in Utah. Brett, glad that you could come in to, to work once in a while. Thanks so, so much for being with us. Well, it's always hard to schedule this, isn't it? <laughs> it certainly is. The Utah Bucket List 2 premieres tonight at 7 on KUED Channel 7, and you can find a few of the archive uh, articles, Brett's articles, along with photo galleries of the Bucket List right here at sltrib.com. Uh, Nancy, why Part 2? Why did we need to do this again, the Utah Bucket List? <laughs> um, you know, there are just so many great, amazing places to see in Utah. There's no way we could cover it with a Bucket List 1 or two or even three. Um, and so we, we got a great viewer response uh, and reader response from the first series and we thought, hey, let's keep going. So we're, we, we pulled up and we're doing number two. Okay, well how did you decide what should be on this list this time around? Uh, that's a tough one. Um, you know, Brett is our major source for a lot of the information. He's our expert. So just because he spent so many years writing about the, the outdoors in Utah. Um, and then we also solicited ideas from viewers. We went out and we talked to, to readers and viewers and people on our Facebook page and said, what kinds of things do you want to do for your, um, you know, bucket list experience um, and it was great we got wonderful responses um, and we chose the pieces that uh, a number of people said they wanted to do or things that we thought were a little unique hmm. and Brett you had some input I assume yes and that some of the stuff is uh, things that I had on the original list when we came up with the idea for the show in the first place which was more than a hundred items and um, we did uh, some of the things that we wanted to do that we didn't get on the first one, but we also did, uh, you know, uh, put a little bit deeper thought into it and take some suggestions from from the public as they provided ideas. Uh, and we were a little bit deeper this time um, as far as trying to find a, a strong connection to these places and uh, share with people the value of of not just being able to do these experiences, but what it means to you as an individual and your family and friends. How, how many of these destinations had you already been to? The new one or the whole show? The um, new one. The new one. Uh, let's see. I am looking at, let's see, we had nine. I'm just looking real quick here. I had been on four of them. Well, no. I had been on, yeah, four of the nine. So. Uh, th there was a lot of new stuff on this one for me. Oh, that's good. I I'm glad to hear that because sometimes you feel like there's not a lot of surprises for you, but I'm hearing that you that's not the case, which is great. Um, let's dive right into some of the destinations that you went to. And one of the first ones that we see is the Hot Air Balloon Festival in Bluff. And I have to say, this is just visually stunning. Um, maybe you can give us some background on the festival, Nancy? Sure. It happens uh, generally in January around Martin Luther King uh, Jr. Day and it's a three-day event. Basically you sponsor a hot air balloon and if you sponsor a balloon you get to to go up in one and uh, it's an amazing experience because not only are you hot air ballooning but you're doing it in one of the most spectacular places on the face of the earth and so on the third day actually they, they do a flight through Valley of the Gods in southern Utah and um, for me it was just such an amazing experience to be up there and floating and, and floating over this red rock and these colorful balloons and uh, it truly was something that um, that I plan to put on my list to keep going back to. I mean it really was an amazing experience. I, I want to give our viewers just a, a taste of it so we're going to take a, a quick look at a, a clip showing some really stunning scenery again this is going floating through the Valley of the Gods and you can see this tonight at 7 on Utah Bucket List 2. Oh, it's so gentle. I mean, this is so peaceful. That's right. Oh, you don't even hardly know you're going.
being in a balloon is really um, uh, a unique experience because you're just sort of floating quietly over the, uh, the landscape and you get a completely different perspective from, from high up. Brett, how long does it take to, to ascend in a hot air balloon? I've never been in one before. It's a kind of a lengthy process. There's a lot uh, to do to get pre-set up and everything and a lot of safety you have to pay attention to. You're dealing with a very hot uh, uh, you know, way to get off the ground <laughs> and it's, it's, it's heavy. The balloon is heavy, the basket is heavy um, and um, it, it's a quite a lengthy process. It happens very often early in the morning um, when it's cool. Um, and that makes it easier for the, the balloons to rise. Um, so it's a, it's quite an experience, Don, um, and the, the process of, of you know helping contribute to your then taking off is is kind of uh, cool in itself. And there's a lot of kind of artsy things that happen as it's going up, as the envelope is filling up, and then when it actually stands straight up, and then there's that moment when you get in the basket, and all of a sudden you're just floating there, and it's it's. Uh, it's a very unique feeling, um, and then it. I, I have to admit that I kind of got a little. I was a little shocked by how actually loud hot air ballooning is. The burners are right over your head, and you're floating. It's all quiet and peaceful, and all of a sudden you have this. Big and uh, it it was kind of intense, but then you know then they went away for a little bit until you needed it again, and then it popped back up. Uh, Nancy, how difficult was it to film that particular segment? Because you've got balloons up high, down low, spread all over the place. Um, uh, and it, it, it appears to the novice, at least to me, that it would be difficult to, to capture that on film. It, it was a, a logistical challenge, to be sure. We have a wonderful videographer, Gary Turnier, who uh, is the principal designer and photographer on this piece. And he really did a great job of just capturing um, the moments. We also mounted GoPros, small little cameras, onto the balloons themselves. And then several of us just had cameras and tried to capture what we could in, in chase balloons and other balloons. Um, and so we really uh, spent a lot of time just trying to capture it from a lot of different angles. But it was challenging. And then we even had somebody who had um, one of those little drones, a uh, little helicopter, and he actually went and he actually captured um, some some footage uh, to give us a, an aerial perspective on an aerial event. So it was uh, it was really quite the challenge, but it was also incredibly rewarding. Mm -hmm. and, and this is something that you need to reserve. You need to line up in order to do this. You said you have to sponsor a balloon, and how many balloons are there? So I think there are about 30, 35 balloons, and um, they limit it because they don't want it to grow too big. They don't want it to be a large festival like, like Albuquerque, which is one of the biggest in the country. Uh, so it's an intimate festival. But you can sponsor a balloon, or you can go and you can um, you could just be an observer, or you can even volunteer to be on a chase crew or help uh, you know fold up and, and, and finish the, the, the balloon ride. Um, there's actually a lot of ground crew work that needs to be done. And every once in a while, if you volunteer, you manage to... Uh, be lucky enough to get a ride. So there are a lot of different ways, but probably the, the most, if you want to guarantee a, a flight, weather depending, if you want to guarantee a flight, sponsoring a balloon is the best way to go. And I think it is important to note that um, it's a very visual thing, even if you're not in the balloon. It's uh, it, a lot of people show up in this tiny town to to witness not only the morning launches, but also the the night glow event at dusk, which was one of the most stunning things, frankly, for me too, was to um, you know they wait till that magic hour at dusk and start lighting up balloons to uh, you know uh, it, it was it was like I, I can't even explain. It. I felt like it was they were these massive tops that were lighting up and then going dark and lighting up. It was it was uh, pretty amazing. It's eye popping. I can only imagine what, what it must be like to be there. Um, sounds incredible. Uh, again, uh, you can watch at Utah Bucket List tonight at 7 o'clock on KUED Channel 7. Also, check out all the stories that Brett's written and our photo galleries right here at sltrib.com. Sure. Um, I want to uh, go on to uh, something that I had actually never heard of, and I've lived here for pretty much most of my life, the Via Ferrata in Ogden Canyon. Um, Nancy, describe what's a Via Ferrata? Via Ferrata actually is Italian for the Iron Road or the Iron Way. 
And uh, it was something that was done in the Dolomites and the Alps, and basically they put iron rungs into the rock so you could climb up on the rock. And it was done, I believe it was World War I, and they would actually you know, traverse the rock. Um, but they're very popular in Europe, and they've become these tourist destinations, and they're really amazing, almost obstacle courses uh, up along rock. And we are fortunate enough to have one of the few that are in the United States. Um, and it's right in Ogden Waterfall Canyon, this amazing, gorgeous 500-foot waterfall that cascades down, and you're climbing the rock, you're scaling the rock um, right, uh, you know, overlooking it. So it's really an amazing thing, and and it's great because you, if you can, if you can hike a few miles, if you can climb a ladder, then you get the experience of basically being a rock climber. Um, maybe not doing the exact maneuvers, but you're up there on the rock, and you're moving your body, and you're positioning, and you're getting the views. And it really allows people who wouldn't normally get to scale those kinds of heights to, to have that experience. Now, this was a route, I understand, developed by a, a native from Ogden. His name is Jeff Lowe. Can you tell us a little bit about him, Nancy? Jeff is uh, perhaps the, one of the premier alpinist um, rock climbers and, and mountaineers in the, in the world. Um, he really is somebody who's just had so many first ascents and has been a pioneer in, in the sport. Um, and he's also somebody who later on in life contracted an illness uh, similar to uh, Lou Gehrig's disease or ALS. He's actually somebody who um, was this amazing, amazing athlete and was then faced with a declining ability to, to maneuver. And he was approached by Chris Peterson, the owner of the property that the Via Frada is on, to design this course. And, and he said, sure, I'll do it, because he realized that he wanted to allow people who wouldn't normally have that experience to have that experience of, of what a mountaineer or rock climber might have. You followed a few first-time Via Ferrata climbers, um, and I, I just want to show a clip uh, from your film, and again, this is Utah Bucket List 2 that premieres tonight at 7 o'clock on KUED Channel 7. I mean, I had been a little bit worried doing the training wall, so when I saw the first pitch right when we started, it was kind of like, okay, I'm excited, here we go, we're starting. And so, you know, on the first few rungs, you're feeling, okay, okay, this isn't so bad, I got it. And then, literally after that first pitch, you start to see more scenery, and then, like, any fear goes out the window. So, from that point on, it's just, you know, you're looking around thinking, how can this get any better? Uh, Brett, are you an experienced climber? I mean, what struck you about Via Ferrata? Um, I, for me, it was was an opportunity to see uh, the way that that Jeff Lowe would have climbed, um, which Chris Peterson pointed out that um, you know I was doing stuff that I never would have imagined doing, um, and you know if I thought that, then I just had to look across the way to what Nancy was doing on the hardest route. Um, uh, I was even more impressed with her abilities at that point, um, but it was um, and that, that I you know the other thing that I think was really interesting about that um, that adventure was the camaraderie that developed amongst the group, um, uh, just in cheering for each other. Um, we were kind of um, competitive when we did this little training wall, and we were kind of teasing each other. And then and then when once we got up there and started on the route, we were. You know, helping each other out. We were uh, very into, you know, congratulating each other for doing something tricky, or you know, kind of maybe getting over a little bit of a fear. And there was there's some times when, you know, uh, there was one time specifically where I was kind of I came to this spot. And I'm like, well, where am I supposed to go from here? And and the answer was there was there was nothing. You know, I mean, it was like a hundred foot drop right there, and I had to step off of the rock I was on onto this rung, and trust that it was not going to give away and and uh, it was kind of a leap of faith, as you might call. But at the same time, uh, we were completely clipped in and safe and everything. So there was that security part of it as well. So you're kind of exploring what you can do on your own, but, but you're safe. And, and that, for me, was important because I don't trust myself in a lot of cases. <laughs> Well, I mean, that sense of camaraderie really came through, I think, in the film, in not just this segment, but many segments. And that is part of uh, the bucket list uh, 
ethos, I guess. I mean, that's really how people are feeling. Once they're entrenched in this shared experience, they cling to each other in new and different ways. Right, Nancy? Oh, absolutely. I mean, this is, I think it's a theme that's gone through the first bucket list and certainly even more so, I think, in this one. And that when you have these common outdoor experiences, you're, you're faced with things you can't always control uh, or often can't control. Um, you're faced with new physical, psychological experiences, and it really is this amazing bonding moment. And so I think that that is, you know, if there's a takeaway, there may be one or two takeaways from the Bucket List series, and I think that's a big one, is the fact that these outdoor experiences really do bond us together. There are these common stories that we create and we share and then we can relive them later on. But it's really critical, I think, for, for families, for friends, um, just to go out and create these common experiences. Mm. Well, one of the most uh, awesome elements, the, the images in Utah Bucket List 2, I think, is the Bryce Canyon uh, at night segment. I mean, I, and I guess people from all over the world come to admire the dark skies uh, at Bryce Canyon. Describe this excursion and, and why this made the list, Nancy. Um, it really was this unique aspect of, I think a lot of us are familiar with Bryce and the beautiful spires and, and um, we actually were looking at maybe doing Bryce in the winter time. Um, and but we found out that they are one of the what, precursors, one of the people who founded this notion of having a night skies program. Um, and so they were one of the parks that really worked to promote this idea that you don't just experience the park during the day, you can go out, you can go out in the evening, you can star watch and stargaze, you can go on full moon hikes, and you can experience the park in a completely different way than you would during the daytime. And so we really wanted to capture that, and we had a unique opportunity because it happened that there was a full moon and an eclipse at the same time. So you get the experience of a full moon hike, and yet it becomes dark, so you can stargaze too. So got the best of both worlds. Talk about great timing. Well done. So, <laughs> <laughs> Brett, the stars have aligned for Utah Bucket List too. <laughs> well, it feels like it. You know, and that, that's, again, that's something that, that I've done through the years. And I was on a different assignment down in Bryce many years ago, and part of it, uh, was you know going to see this you know this stargazing event at the park with the the dark rangers and um, it you know I loved it and it was wonderful and um, started to kind of follow that and did a couple stories through the years and it just felt like it's an important part of um, the Utah opportunities that we have and and a part that not a lot of people understand you know I mean that's that's a big part of also what we're trying to do with the, the bucket list ideal is is get people into unique experiences that they can make those special memories with their families speaking of unique experiences I want to finish up with the Tavaputs uh, our resident funny man columnist Robert Kirby uh, he let you tag along on one of his favorite excursions um, the Tavaputs Ranch maybe tell us a little bit about this place and we'll play a clip well you know it's um, uh, it, it, it's one of the most beautiful remote locations in the in the state um, and you know Kirby's written about it several times um, in his columns and uh, I kind of picked up that it might might have meant a little something to him so it, that kind of played into our Utah bucket list too idea too in the sense of you know making more clearly um, relevant that connection that we all have to special places and uh, for Kirby uh, there's a reason why he's drawn to that area, and and he's funny and he's ha ha about stuff, but but he's got a very serious side, and um, uh, that place does that to people. It makes you reflect. It makes you think um, about what we are here for and why places like that matter so much. And you know, frankly, at the end, where you might want to you know have your ashes reside, and. Um, that's uh, that's that's Kirby's place, and I wanted to get him explaining that notion that that uh, there's a bucket list, is a place you should uh, go and spend time with your family, so they have special memories of you when you're not around, um, and they can think about you. And then there's there's places that go beyond that that are places you want, you know, to to be able to watch the you know the, watch the dragon wake up as Kirby called it in the in the sunrise on the Tabaputs. Let's take a look.
It's a way of decompressing. You don't realize how stressed you've been until you get up here and there's no other sound except the wind going through the trees and your heartbeat. And uh, we do a lot of range quick trips, bringing them down in to show them the great artifacts that are in there. What's it like rounding up those large animals? I mean, some of those trails, I'm sorry, look very, very narrow. Uh, it was, um, it, it's pretty intense, you know, and, and the the, um, uh, the horses know what they're doing. Um, the dogs help a lot, and of course the cowboys know what they're doing as well. Um, so, um, but it is pretty intense, and it really is a, a kind of a flashback to the past in the West, and um, and that's a special feeling in such a remote place. I mean, part of why it's still the way it is is because it is so remote and so rugged. Um, you know, as Butch and Jeannie Jensen, you know, realized they can't do um, roundups like many ranchers do these days with ATVs and motorcycles and trucks. They um, rely on horses purely. And um, those cows have never seen a, the inside of a semi truck, you know, trailer. They've only ever seen that trail between the desert and the high country. And uh, it's it's a uh, it's an important connection that way too to have um, that feeling of, of stepping back and stepping away from our daily grind and and routine. Bucket list part one, you had powder skiing, you did some white water, rafting. This time around, Nancy, what were what were some of the segments that were the most difficult to capture? Um, I think definitely Via Ferrata was a challenge because you're, you're up and down and then I tried to go on a, a separate route. There were three routes, so I climbed another route to try and shoot film straight across. So that was definitely just physically challenging. Um, and, and then there were stories where we really were focusing more on the camaraderie of people. And so we didn't maybe have quite the, the time, you know, going down big rapids, but we spent more in camp and trying to capture just the, the feel of what was going on, sort of those kinds of stories that, that had their own unique challenges. So the interesting thing about the bucket list from a, a sort of technical standpoint is that each and every place has its own unique challenges. I mean, definitely Tabletfoot's Plateau and the Roundup. I mean, you know, you, it's very difficult to film on horseback. Everything looks like, you know, <laughs> so you can't really do it. So how do you capture it? So it's, it's, it's been a, a challenge, I think, especially for our audio and video crews to, to find a way to actually bring these experiences to life. Do you have a favorite segment in part two? Yeah, oh, that's like asking who your favorite kid is. That's cruel. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm asking. <laughs> um... I think I have favorite experiences, um, but I think for me, I guess the, the final segment in the piece, the Splore segment, which is a, a company that um, brings the outdoors to people who have accessibility issues, whether they're physical uh, barriers or financial barriers. Um, going on that trip, I think, just was so special, and just the people were so amazing, um, both the volunteers and the participants, that just watching that segment brings back all those memories. So maybe that wasn't my most, you know, like physically amazing experience in terms of trying to scale rocks or being up in a balloon, but I think emotionally that's definitely the most touching segment for me. Mm. Brett, you? Uh, you know, uh, they're all amazing. Um, uh, Explorer is something that I was one of the very first stories I did as an outdoors reporter for the Tribune um, on the San Juan River and I've done it a couple times through the year so that was very special indeed and that's why it was on the list. Uh, Spiral Jetty was something that I had not done that I had wanted to do for a long time and it, it, there was a unique experience there um, that I experienced with the crew and, and Hikmet um, who took us out there and showed us um, explain to us what we were seeing, um, and that was special. And the that day was just a, a a cool Utah, northern Utah, late fall day, and uh, that was special. There were some good memories there. Um, but I I do I, I think that probably what ended up being, you know, maybe not my favorite, but one that I think a lot of people really like was our artist in residence 
um, story um, in Zion, um, where we followed a violinist around for a couple of days um, in a very special program that the National Park Service does for, for artists. And uh, being there and having her play and seeing the reaction of people as she played was, uh, was very special and unique. Uh, you know, how many times you go to Zion and do the Canyon Overlook Trail and run into somebody playing the violin in an alcove that's a perfect amphitheater, and then watch people from New England waltz, you know, I mean, it was really, wow. <laughs> so, they're all great, they're all unique, um, yeah, but I, I like that one a lot. Um, do I hear part three coming on? Is I mean, is there more to do, more to see, more recommendations to make? for people's bucket lists. Nancy Green? There, there are always more. There's in Utah. <laughs> there's always more in Utah. Um, you know, part three we're looking at. One of the things we're, we're um, faced with right now is such a difficult task. We're looking at, it's going to be the 100th, or it was the 100th anniversary of the National Park System coming up. And so that's one thing that we're looking at right now. Um, that's going to be in 2016. So, um, I don't know, as, as a favorite phrase of a lot of the people at KUED is, stay tuned. Stay <laughs> tuned. We will leave it there. Nancy Green of KUED Channel 7, Brett Prettyman of the Salt Lake Tribune, thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. And again, check out the Utah Bucket List 2 tonight at 7 o'clock on KUED Channel 7. And, of course, you can find the full archive of Brett's work online here at sltrib.com along with photo galleries. They're really spectacular. I'm Jennifer Napier-Pierce with the Salt Lake Tribune. Thanks so much for tuning in to Trib Talk today. We'll see you next time.